What I do, what I do. This is the Brothers on Books podcast, where we find great books that will give you real value and actionable steps and have fun in the process. Please reach out to us at brothersonbooks at gmail.com for any book recommendations, or if you would like to be a guest host for a particular book you have in mind. A great review or rating on whichever platform you're listening to would be greatly appreciated. And lastly, if you can think of any friend, family member, or coworker that might like this episode, please pass it along. Furthermore, we're also on Instagram at Brothers on Books. I'm Alex Allwild, and with me as always is my brother Jack Allwild. Jack, how you doing? Doing quite well, Al. How's it going there? Yeah, it's 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 going. It's doing pretty well. Uh, today we are doing the book, The Nomad Capitalist, by Andrew Henderson. So, Jack, you picked this book. Uh, I guess how did you how did you come upon it, and uh, what did you think? You know, so I heard Andrew Henderson speak for the first time as I was walking in dreary Vienna during the during the pandemic, and I think that's really when his YouTube channel exploded. And this book exploded and he was getting interviewed by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, so that was the first time I heard him and it was kind of in the back of my mind. But I kind of just thought this sounded like, I don't know, a little bit of fear mongering that, you know, you need to go out and get other passports and maybe he just wasn't happy. And I don't know, it kind of felt like he was running away from something. But, um, you know, I kind of started questioning like the drawing of country lines the last couple of years I'd say and uh this just seemed I, like the next progression of uh evaluating something that I think we never really challenge and that is uh our citizenship because I would almost say that I have while it hasn't been a lot I've almost challenged my religion more than my citizenship like giving up my citizenship is literally never really crossed my mind until the last couple of years and it's still not like a strong feeling but like i never even questioned it interesting so i guess that means that at some point you've contemplated giving up your religion well at least at least i thought like okay there are other religions that i theoretically could switch to okay I, 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 i'm not I, i'm not saying i wouldn't want to be um i i I, I, n- I never would give up my religion either but um i at least had thought like oh there's other religions like it never really cro- crossed my mind. Like, oh, like there's other citizenships. I, I will, I will say he makes. Uh, there is definitely in America. There is definitely a dogmatic belief that America is the best, uh, and he definitely paints a picture where that is most definitely not true. Uh, I I would say uh, shows a lot of the sort of the downfalls, especially in the taxes and how you pay taxes as an American citizen uh, outside of America. I don't know, because I guess there are only two countries, and I, I guess we'll talk about this later, there are only two countries where if you're not living and or working in a country, you still have to pay taxes to that country, and one of those countries is America. The other one, I guess, is a, was it a treaty? Eritrea, yeah. Eritrea, yeah, in Africa. Uh which I think is kind of weird. It is weird. He 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 does. I mean, it's not all like it's not like we're in like a prison though, because he he does bring up there's um, you know, a fixed uh, income exclusion, like a, or a foreign income exclusion if you're if you are living overseas as an American. I think it was more than ten or eleven months out of the year. You do you are excluded from like the first I think hundred and twelve thousand dollars if you made money overseas so it's not like you're always getting taxed necessarily but oh, okay. it's um, I, to- I i totally missed that so that that does change things yeah but it, i mean definitely i mean and we'll get into it like the trends on people renouncing seems a little i mean startling to me um just yeah it's just kind of like the rumblings of something maybe so I guess, Jack, what were some of your main takeaways from the book? Um, I would say, you know, we, we talk about diversifying against asset classes all the time, but we don't really talk about diversifying throughout jurisdictions, always in, you know, this idea of spreading your money out around different bank accounts and how, um, and especially right now, your your money might not be as safe as 
people once thought. And um, yeah, just get the more optionality you can have in your life, the better. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think he, I, I like that he kind of got rid of the negative connotations of like offshore banking and all that offshore banking means is like, it's not in your domestic um, land, essentially. It, it does, it's not anything like sleazy or shady necessarily. Right. He was saying if you if you live in Seattle, but you have a bank in Vancouver, that is by definition offshore banking, which mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would uh, think is some criminal, you know, mastermind. Yeah. Uh, I sort of thought the, the just the the phrase like go where you're treated best is what really stuck out to me. And, and it's like such a simple like idea. And I think people don't people one don't appreciate it and i think a lot of times you don't know if you're not being treated well uh in the banking in the banking section they talk about how you know for some of these banks you have to pay all these wire tri like if you want to wire someone money like either the bank can't do it they won't do it they make you jump through all these hoops or they charge you they actually charge you fees to do it i when i was buying my last house uh I needed a cashier's check and I think my bank charged me $20 for a cashier's check for my own money. Yeah. I got, I got charged for 30 bucks for a wire um, a couple months ago to purchase some land. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, you probably do it more than me, but like on, on the day to day, I don't even really notice those things because I'm never doing it, but I just think it's so, it's just so in, insane that you need to pay the bank additional money to get access to your money, which I just think is silly. Um, so they, they bring up in the book how some of these, you know, I guess, quote unquote, offshore banks will offer interest rates around like five or 6%. And, you know, I just recently saw, I, I used this money manager called Wealthfront and they were offering four and a half percent just on a savings account. And I took all the money out of my savings account and I just put it into Wealthfront because you know, they're offering me four and a half versus the essentially parsley like point one that I get in my, you know, my my normal banking account. Yeah. And recently, a lot of people have been pulling money out of their bank account and putting it in like treasuries, like they're using treasuries as like a bank account, because um, especially if you don't really need access to it right away. Right. Or, or you know, <clears throat> you know, as we talked about bank stability in this book, I, I kept I honestly kept think, going back to all of our conversations about whole life and just thinking really whole life is just, obviously I feel superior to some mm -hmm. of these banks. Uh, so I don't remember what, uh, from our conversation with Chris Noggle, like I don't remember the, the failure rate on some of those, those mutual insurance companies is abysmally low where the failure rate on a lot of these banks is surprisingly high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, any other takeaways that you had from the book, Jack? I don't think so. What about you, Al? Any other any last thoughts? Yeah, he had this. Uh, he had a section on more or less like dating, health, and like family planning. And uh, I thought the I thought the health section was pretty interesting. Where like some of this, he's yet again in like. Uh, I've definitely fallen into this. It's somewhat dogmatic that I believe, and I think many Americans believe that the healthcare in America is the best. Uh, but he showed that you know in other countries they have very good healthcare that does not uh, always cost as much. So I think from one of our previous talks with, uh, with I believe it was Dr. G, that if, if as long as you don't have you know very very uh, bad forms of health can get very good uh, health care around the world. But then probably the last thing I sort of found very interesting was more or less the section on like what I would dictate is like family planning, where, you know, there are many countries that give out citizenship if you're born there. So while you can be somewhat nomadic around the world, like when you're thinking about what is best for your like future children, like you should think about where you want to have your child so you know they can get citizenship in a different country 
But if you as an American give birth to them, they can then very easily apply for citizenship to the U.S. So you're setting them up for more success just based on where you can go and literally give birth. Uh, I, I thought that was a very interesting point, something that I would I would literally never have thought of. So you're uh, thinking of going and having a kid in Brazil, Al? <laughs> uh, kid could be on the Brazilian soccer team. <laughs> well, I mean, for me to have that thought right now, I would first have to be someone I want to have a child with. But, uh, you know, the thought has now crossed my mind. So, you know, maybe in like five years, we'll see. El Nino. <laughs> yeah, El Nino. Okay. Maybe, maybe stand out a little bit from the rest of the Brazilians. Okay. <laughs> we, we do have a special guest. Um coming on with us to discuss some of these topics. Her name is Jovanna Vojinovic. Uh, she's currently the Senior Director at Nomad Capitalist and has held various roles since joining the company in early 2019. She started her career with Nomad Capitalist as a Research and Development Associate. Before joining the company, Jovanna worked in various international organizations across Europe that focused on such areas as transitional justice, reconciliation, and peace. Ivana graduated from the University of Belgrade with a bachelor's degree in political science and international politics, as well as a master's degree in political science and international security. So with that, let's get to Yovana. Yovana, welcome to the Brothers on Books podcast. So nice of you to join us. Well, thank you. <laughs> So, so let's get right into it. How about you give us a little bit of background on how you joined the Nomad Capitalist and kind of how it plays into your feelings of personal freedom? Well, the story about me joining Nomad Capitalist is not uh, not particularly amusing. It was very regular uh, route. Um, so I have previously uh, studying uh international politics and international relations and uh, you know all of this kind of fun stuff um, with a highlight of international security so that was my master uh, master studies uh, and I always was very strong on kind of freedom peace prosperity um, so <clears throat> the highlight in my studies was always on countries that do not have it, right? Or the countries that are participating in war. Hence, uh, that's why I decided later to, to, to study um, international security. So um, it was kind of tied up, but somewhere in the middle of my studies, I just decided, uh, or I actually realized that governments are not really helping much. So, uh, in that way, I was not, if I if I was due to make an impact, <laughs> uh, government field was probably not something that, um, or not the area that, where I wanted to work in. Though it was kind of natural, right? You study that, you go to government or, um, you know, some diplomatic um, area or uh, NGOs. Uh, but just by realizing how those institutions work, uh, it was it was just slow, robust, a lot of procedures, and really no no real impact from from my perspective. So I got kind of <laughs> I was kind of depressed of what what are we doing next? Where when I got familiar with um, Nomad Capitalist, uh, first of all through 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 YouTube. Uh, that just started booming at, at that era, uh, that time, um, and I knew some people that um, that worked there. Um, they spoke very very highly of the company and, uh, in a way, what their uh, what Nomad Capitalist was doing. Um, so that for me kind of tied up, actually giving people uh, freedom that um, that they wanted that they didn't have, um, and obviously kind of. The whole different light on on the global immigration right so when you're kind of looking at it from from government perspective it's always refugees and things like that but then actually you're i just started realizing that there is the whole group of people that um actually can help those countries by you know relocating there and um 
you know, bringing monetary contribution to those countries, investing in those countries, and that that group of people will probably make a larger impact than a government and NGOs itself. So it was all kind of starting to come along with me. Um, I was also participating uh, during my studies in some very liberal movement, you know, about taxes and, uh, you know, general state of freedom and freedom of speech. Um, so it kind of all perfectly tied up. Um, and then I, I applied for a job, got a job um, and started uh, doing pretty much research and development of some projects. So discovering um, countries that are good for investors that, uh, you know, can uh, can help uh, reduce your taxes, uh, can give you like a very fast citizenship, good citizenship options. So this is how the whole journey started. Okay. Uh, interesting. So I guess based on what you just said at the last bit, when you're when you're researching countries, what what are you looking for? When you're looking about bringing capital to a country, like what about a country, I guess, would entice you to go there? Yeah, so um, what we have is a bit of a different approach. So when people are looking for kind of bringing capital to the country, they are always looking for massive amount of capital, right? So someone coming in and opening, I don't know, a thousand jobs or similar. So we're really looking at this on an individual level. So how you as an individual can make an impact um, in certain country. And what I really like is that many countries now started realizing that. So we can see that with this whole boom of um, digital nomad visas, uh, where countries just started realizing, okay, we can benefit from pretty much anyone coming in and spending money in our country. Uh, hence, we want to we want to facilitate that. So, uh, to get back to your question, when we when we're looking into a country, we're looking what you know how much you can contribute, obviously, to it, and what you can get in in return, whether that is. Um, you know, uh, lower taxes, whether that is, um, you know, passports, residence, or a good real estate investment uh, in a specific country by, you know, investing in it. Uh, but obviously, your monetary contribution on a kind of micro scale is helping developing that country. Of the clients of the nomad capitalists, where do you see them migrating to the most or what countries are kind of on the rise in terms of setting up bank accounts and second citizenships? So those are kind of two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to say, that, you know, you don't bank where, where you uh, have everything. Um, so we we are approaching this really from, from a kind of global and holistic approach. So you don't have to bank, have citizenship, residence, pay taxes, and have your investment in one country. Uh, and most like... In, vast majority of case, this is not something that is the best solution for you, right? So you can you know, go in another country and get way better investment options, um, or a certain country will give you citizenship for you know, X amount of money that the other won't, um, and so on. But uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to where people are migrating uh, from and where to, we definitely see the big trend especially after COVID um, and maybe even during that period, but people from Western countries um, like US, Canada, UK, um, and kind of Europe as a whole, uh, migrating to something that was previously considered maybe emerging countries or, you know, um, second world countries. Um, so there is slowly but surely that shift where uh, people in from US are migrating somewhere else for different reasons. One of the reasons might be taxes. Um, obviously, freedom element is a big thing. They may, might disagree with certain policies in their countries that they think that um, are kind of restrictive towards their freedom. Obviously, during during pandemic, we you know the lockdowns uh, kind of contributed to that just because um, well there were some heavy lockdowns in U.S., Canada, especially you know some some countries were widely open without any specific requirements. So uh, that was really a big motivator. Obviously, with um, increased amount of remote 
remote jobs. Uh, this really encouraged a lot of people to uh, go and search for lower costs of living, but way better, um, let's say, standard of living for, for that amount of money. So, um, I mean, we we see it pretty much going in, in a lot of different directions. Obviously, Dubai and UAE in general were, uh, were a country that um, really really progressed during the last couple of years with so many people um, coming in. So previously it was, uh, they had a, a amazing progress in the last, um, in the last decades, but mostly foreign workers were coming to Dubai. Now more and more investors are coming in. Um, so because of tax system predominantly, but also uh, kind of living conditions uh, and uh, certain certain freedoms that they can get there. Um, and we're seeing definitely more investors coming in. They're, they were really, uh, they're trying to facilitate crypto industry in some ways, uh, not in banking, but, um, you know, they are giving different license, uh, licenses for crypto companies. So Dubai, um, Dubai and in general, UAE has been really, you uh, really booming in the last couple of years. Uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, they they attracted a lot of people um, during pandemic, just because they were open, Mexico especially, like widely open, no, um, no vaccine mandates, no entry requirements. So um, with so many people just driving across the border and um, getting in Mexico um, and uh, establishing a residence there, uh, maybe purchasing a property uh, and just continuing living there. As I said, Costa Rica, I think Canadians especially love Costa Rica. Um, I would say, I think there is a whole shift. Um, so before, before pandemic, um, Southeast Asia was really uh, heavy on um, remote workers or freelancers, those digital nomads, they, they lived predominantly in Southeast Asia. We all, all know her, Bali, Indonesia. Um, there were really big communities there. Um, I think now, just because of um, those pandemic requirements that they had, um, and they were really slow opening up, uh, people started moving more in Latin America uh, and Central America. So that's probably be is going to be like a go-to region in the next couple of years. Obviously, a big okay. country was for maybe a bit more wealthier people was Portugal. Um, Uruguay starting to be really interesting. I know a lot of a uh, lot of people, especially Germans, uh, they they enjoy Paraguay. So those are some of the kind of next hubs for for digital nomads definitely interesting why would the why do you think the germans are gravitating towards paraguay it's kind of Just, historical connection ah, okay country. interesting paraguay. and they well, have I... communities yeah there so um they can you know speak german uh between themselves so that that is one of the reasons I guess so. Th there was a pretty big emphasis on the book of getting a second passport. And I guess we were just talking about immigration. So when you're looking for, I mean, other than, I guess, reducing your taxes, when you're looking at obtaining a second passport, where, what are some of the things you're looking at in the, I guess, potential countries? Sure. So the first thing, you know, you need to ask yourself why you're looking for a second passport. So for some people, that is really a matter of travel freedom. Um, obviously, for many non-Western countries, uh, they are looking for more passports just to have access to certain countries. So a lot of, you know, Chinese businessmen uh, need access to Europe in order just to deal, to, to do a regular business. So they would look for passports that do offer them such an option. So visa-free travel to uh, to Europe or the same thing for with Russians or some other countries. Um, on the other side, like if you're coming from a Western country, obviously you might still want um, a passport that will increase your travel freedom and with which you will have access to China, Russia, and some other countries that you might not necessarily have with, with your passport. But you might also want something that we internally call plan B. 
basically a passport that it provides you additional layer of security that provides you additional layers of security for your uh, family, but also for your assets, like something where, um, you know, you can quickly go to that country, um, you know, relocate there, live there, and so on. So there is really a big difference of why you want it. Um, and also when you want it, right? So there are a couple of countries that offer so-called citizenship by investment, where you come in, you apply, you need to meet a couple of conditions, you know, clear criminal record, clear health history. And for, you know, $100,000 plus, you get a passport in six to nine months down the line. Um, or there are countries like Malta, which is the only European Union country that has it. So eighteen one million dollar in eighteen months, um, and you get EU passport down the line. So, but you know you may also want to, if your goal is establishing multiple citizenships, uh, just for the purpose of, you know, increasing the travel freedom or protection, and you you do not want to give a donation as such um to to those countries it's not urgent for you you might want to look into okay what are the options that will give me a passport in a couple of years uh down the road where i can you know become a citizen there uh, and what i need to do to become a citizen so then you you were kind of can divide the group of those countries um you know couple whether you need to live there how much you need to invest or can you just invest something and never show up there so it it kind of all ties up when you start thinking on why you want it what's your end goal um and how you are going to achieve it so whether to immediate financial contribution or you are okay with spending some time in the country so instead of money you invest your time in that country and get a citizenship down the road i guess you mentioned i i don't want to go off too much on a tangent but you mentioned crypto a little bit and he he mentions Portugal as very crypto friendly. What other countries um, are crypto friendly? <laughs> yeah, well, is there such thing? <laughs> um, well, first of all, we, we need to make a difference between you know friendly for personal um, uh -huh. uh, uh, for, for you personally or for setting up a company. Uh, so it depends on whether you are day-to-day -day trader or you are a holder. Um, and most of countries can be very crypto friendly. Like you mentioned Portugal, when you're just holding crypto. Uh, but if you are trading crypto on a day-to-day -day basis or on a very frequent basis, and that is uh, one of uh, main source of income, Portugal is definitely not um, so fr uh, fr friendly towards that. And what I, be what I mean by that is they will charge you taxes on it. So they will consider that as a professional activity. Uh, and obviously you will pay it as, um, um, you know, instead of just capital gains, you'll pay income tax on that also. So um, kind of depends on what you are also looking for. Um, Cayman Islands are, you know, very fine when it comes to crypto regulation. Uh, obviously we know, <laughs> we know about Bahamas. Um, so UAE is very friendly when it comes to giving different licenses to different companies to deal with crypto. But very, very interesting thing is that, uh, let's say UAE banks are not so crypto friendly. So while you might get, you know, a good license for your crypto company, um, you know, your personal taxes, if you live there will be sorted out, you know, that all of that is fine. Um, but and when it comes to actually banking with a crypto company or transferring crypto through regular kind of bank channels, then it becomes difficult in UAE. So in this case, you will need to kind of look further to, to diversify more um, and really set up uh, 
good banking system and good banking infrastructure. The said Cayman is also giving a lot of uh, a lot of licenses, different licenses for different um, crypto regulations. Obviously, Portugal is known to be kind of crypto friendly country, unless it, when it comes to banking. Now they are um, really putting their pawn on it and. Um, they are imposing a new regulation, so making it really harder to uh, to transfer, to convert crypto to to fiat currencies. So just for some clarification, so when you when you say that, like, uh, I guess when you say a country is friendly to crypto, but not necessarily like the banking practices, like exactly, I, I guess I'm sort of struggling. What what exactly does that mean? Like, so it makes it hard to use the crypto in in the banking system, but then. I guess how is the country itself friendly? Yeah, so for example, like I'll just take UAE as a one of best examples of it. Um, so if you if you have a crypto related business uh, or anything kind of crypto related, you can get you can get your business license. Um, so that can really be sorted out nicely legally. Country is issuing that. Um, so you don't have to, you know, go through some weird classifications of your business as it exists in certain countries. So not every single country today is on a level to, to say, yeah, your company is licensed to deal with crypto, right? So in UAE, for example, you can do that. They are issuing a uh, whole bunch of those kind of stuff. Um, so obviously when you have a company, you need to open a bank account for your company, no matter whether the company is dealing fully on crypto. Uh, but you know, to if you're having employees or whatever to 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 do some processing there. Um, and this is where things are becoming hard. So bank will allow it, but then for every single transaction, they might ask you to to show them the proof, especially if you're converting, as I said, um, crypto to fiat, like you will need to deliver them a bunch of documents. Um, they want to see where the money is coming from. So um, they actually kind of want to regulate this free uh, flow of, uh, of money uh, from crypto. So um, that is what is what has been increasingly a problem in in many of those countries and increasing increased problem for uh, many crypto investors or companies uh, where they can they really need to go above and beyond with paperwork just to be able to you know process their 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 payments um, with the banking sector. So one part of that is why that is happening is that you know banks do not want money that they don't know where it is coming from. Uh, so they want to make sure that you have all the supporting documents uh, to verify for them to verify where did you get money, why, and so on. Uh, I guess just from a philosophical standpoint, why would you think that the government would want to be friendly, but then make it hard for the, I guess, entrepreneur in the banking sector? Like, don't you, wouldn't it make more sense if the banks and the government were kind of on the same page about like what would be easy allowed versus like sort of frowned upon. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with with you on that one. It doesn't, it really doesn't make more sense, much sense, but it, it kind of speaks to a bit outdated banking sectors um, all across the board, where you still need to kind of just submit a bunch of documents for for many for every single transaction so uh i would say in this specific case with uae i would say the government is more advanced than banks are um so banks are not following uh, following the government in this specific case and their their willingness to uh to to accept crypto um and one part of that is I mean, there is still this kind of outdated understanding that is coming from banking sector that uh, crypto is, you know, is used for money laundering and dirty money and so on. And obviously, they they don't want that in in their system. So, I think there will, you know, we will still need to work, banks will still need to put some work in um, their systems to to make sure that they are on the same page with government. So. I cannot necessarily say that this is kind of government thing. It, it's more of a just outdated thinking from bank bankers' side. 
Yeah, because I remember he mentioned in the book, like in certain countries like Bosnia, like the Fed has all these requirements, but like the banks would want to take your money, but it just the system makes it hard. And like, but like Serbia, it sounded like the Fed was, you know, wanting investment, but the banks were kind of difficult to deal yeah, with. <laughs> yeah, the different, different, different countries operate under a different system. I, just, I was just explaining kind of for crypto and, and UAE, where banks are the ones that sell, ah, and we're still a bit more conservative uh, and uh, we're afraid that where this money is coming from. Um, obviously, on the other side, you have some like wildly um, banks that are really looking to to accept everyone. But then you not only have countries regulation, but you also have those all international compliance. So like FATCA for US or CRS, that banks do need to comply, which is why it's also really hard to innovate um, in a banking sector uh, because like in this in this very example, like US will impose that in order to do a business with their citizen, you need to comply with FATCA and then you need to pay to comply with that standard. Um, and uh, it, it really is demotivating for especially like people starting in a fintech or willing to uh, willing to innovate in banking sector uh, to to come up with something new when you do have so many compliance rules um, <clears throat> on a global level um, that really slows down all the changes. So would, would you say from just an international standpoint, the U.S. regulations uh, hinder non-U.S. banks from taking U.S. money? Like they make it, I, I guess, is the point of some of the U.S. regulations to stop international banks from taking U.S. money? Well, I guess the point is knowing where you whether you're hiding money somewhere else. So uh, I, I still hear this you know, people speaking, oh, it's possible to hide money somewhere. Um, and, you know, this idea that you can still can go with a sack full of money in Cayman Islands and put your money uh, in a bank and no one will know, uh, that pretty much doesn't exist <laughs> today. Um, and one part why the FATCA uh, exists or um, why U.S. is trying to 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 put their pawn or, or and every single bank and accounts is for them to know whether their citizens are hiding money somewhere else. So all banks have, so if as a U.S. citizen, you need to pretty much fill out all the paperwork when you're opening a bank account, additional paperwork to say, okay, I'm a U.S. citizen or I have connection with the U.S., um, or a U.S.-based company, or I'm even working with the U.S. Uh, to fill out all, all of those forms, then a bank is reporting that back to uh, back to U.S. and specifically IRS, so um, they can pretty much um, you know compare their data and know whether you are having account somewhere or, or not. Hey, hey. When, Go I was just going to say, wouldn't you say that is sort of a downstream effect of that, like? Uh, I mean, in the book, he talks about how some of these foreign banks, or I guess foreign to us, would give interest rates of like, you know, five or six percent. Or, But um, I mean, my savings rate, I think I, I, mean, I just took all the money out of it because I was getting 0.1 percent. And I was actually, as I was reading this, I was thinking about opening up, just trying to open up some bank account elsewhere to get a higher yield. Uh, if I'm only putting a thousand dollars, in, wouldn't some of those regulations deter a bank from taking my money? Well, not necessarily. I mean, now most of the banks in the world are, are compliant with that. So they will say, you know, this is this is our cost of doing doing business with you. They are obliged to give you the same uh, rights as non-US people. So, I mean, there is a very, very limited number of banks and they are usually very big. Uh, they can say, yeah, we, we actually don't care about US money and we don't care about working with US citizens um, and we don't want to comply with those rules. So very limited amount of banks, you know, have that kind of luxury. So I mean, most of the worldwide banks will, will do it. Um, yeah, obviously there is, there, there might be some, um, 
some limitation in terms of what kind of services you can get. Uh, but uh, in most of the cases, they, they will open an account. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so so in, in, in Andrew's writing, um, he talks about how the U.S. banks wouldn't, they don't rank in like the top 40 banks worldwide. Do you like what, do you know what goes into those rankings? Cause I, I was kind of shocked that uh, about those, I, I guess what, what, what class, what makes a bank great? And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, there was a recently, I mean, uh, in the aftermath of what, what was happening with SVB and signature and so on, um, there was um, like a ranking published on one of the biggest banks and kind of the best banks in the world is, let's say, HSBC, which is not not U.S. bank and um, like DBS and a lot of lot of Asian banks are now becoming stronger and stronger. Um, also, we now see the whole rise of um, uh, of uh, Middle Eastern banks, specifically like. Gulf banks like UAE, uh, Saudi Arabian banks are really becoming way stronger. So obviously, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not a banker, uh, so I don't know what what are all the things that kind of people are taking into consideration when looking into bank ratings. Obviously, um, their um, their stability, how they are handling, um, how they are handling money, how risky they are. Uh, and things like that are class or like number of customers, number of deposits. That, that that those are all the things that are taking into consideration when it comes to looking at kind of what what are the best and the biggest banks in the world. Uh, but yeah, usually like bank U.S. banks are not not on the top of the list. Like now, the top of the list is almost all Asia. Is it just mainly like? Uh... I guess the strength, yeah, strength, or do the Asian banks have the same uh, <clears throat> reserve requirements? I guess does that play? Do you know if that plays a role in it? Like, yeah, this is country by country base. Obviously, uh, what's interesting in this is that U.S. does have the like, highest deposits uh, insurance, so most of the other countries has <clears throat> have less than a uh, hundred thousand dollars equivalent. Uh, so some countries even do have smaller. Uh, there are some like weird countries that do have theoretically unlimited deposits, but uh, there's probably you don't want to open an account there. Um, so like just to give you an example of a country like Bel Belarus, they have unlimited insurance deposit, but you don't want to have a bank account there. So uh, they do have. Uh, most of the other countries do have lower lower deposit uh, insurance than the, U the U.S. But what we often speak and advise our clients is that so if if that is something that you feel comfortable and only feel comfortable with, so keeping your money up until um, a deposit uh, insurance deposit uh, amount, then you can. Just, diversification is really a solution. So whether that is diversification across different banks, diversification across different, um, you know, currencies and jurisdictions. So, um, you know, just open accounts uh, up until deposit, insurance deposit in different countries. And then, you know, first see, see how you feel about that bank um, and whether you want to kind of increase those, uh, those limits or not. But if you're just diversify on that basic principle on keeping your money across multiple jurisdictions up until um, deposits, you know, you, you, you do have kind of large chunk of money that, that will be deposited and kind of in case kind of global collapse happens, it will be returned to you. I, I guess just sort of another philosophical question. Uh, you, he, Andrew mentions Peter Schiff in this book, and I listened to him quite a bit. And he often sort of blames FDIC on people on people not caring about how they bank. Like at least in America, it's like if if you know that your deposit's insured, you don't care. You don't really care what bank you put your money into. And I can just personally say that I I feel the same way. Do Do you think that that plays some type of role into maybe I guess banks you know 
being somewhat more flippant with how they invest and maybe I guess a weakening of banks as a general practice? Uh, that definitely, because it speaks to, uh, in a way, kind of responsibility of a bank towards towards clients. Uh, definitely, there are more there are more people kind of demanding. Okay, well, I, I want to understand where where this money goes. Don't don't look at it as your money, uh, as a and as a loan. Uh, I think there will be slightly different picture uh, across the board. Um, and most of the people don't even think about it. So <clears throat> it takes an event like this for people to start thinking, okay, is it my, is my money secure? How is my how is my bank um, you know disposing my money? What are doing with it? Um, you know, if something happened, how much I will get? Is it insured? Is it really the best deal? Do I even like this bank, right? Uh, and is the service they are providing good? So up until those levels. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. So people in most cases don't even think about this and don't even think about, okay, that somewhere else I can get a better value for my money. Uh, maybe a bank will, you know, there are banks that are operating on a principles of 100% liquidity. So they're just taking your money, saving it, um, and, you know, keeping it there, um, and you might, you know, pay, pay some fees for, for, for it. Uh, they, they have other ways of getting, uh, getting their money, but they're not, uh, loaning your money to anyone. So they don't issue credit cards. They don't issue loans. Um, and <clears throat> they're much more, uh, much more safer than, than kind of regular banks. Um, it's still very rare, but there are those countries like, um, for example, like Cook Islands, it's very known that they, they do have banks that are operating under almost 100% liquidity principle where your money is uh, very safe, secure, and they are no, there are no chances that they will issue uh, any loans, credit cards, or just basic principles of um, loaning money. So, uh, for example, the, you know, that's not something w what people are thinking of. And I definitely agree. I think if, if more people started thinking and asking their banks how, how what they are doing with the money afterwards, after you deposit and after they gave you like 1% interest, uh, where that money goes, how is that used? Uh, I think the bank will need to... Um, would need to increase their also responsibility towards towards your money but again i think we're so used to just putting it in, in the closest banks okay maybe, maybe a bank has you know a, an online service something very convenient and easy that's it it's local one and um you know i i don't have to think about it uh which is not always the greatest option and as i said i until the event like this happened, people just don't think about it. So I think I'd like to shift a little bit to, so most most of our audience is American. Um, I mean, so, some of the charts, um, the trends in Andrew's book are a little bit startling, I would say. So, I mean, I looked at the number of people renouncing versus the population. And in 2010, it was about five people per million. And in 2020, it was about 20 people per million. So I guess um, if you were to kind of think about the pros and cons of American citizenship, how what, what would you say? What, what are the biggest pros of being an American versus uh, giving up your an American citizenship? Yeah, the, the, very interesting question. <laughs> I'm not American citizen, I, so I, I don't cannot speak from uh, that personal perspective. Uh, but I can tell you what we see is that yeah. more and more people are thinking about this, and there are different different reasons why they are thinking about this. Um, so when we're speaking about renunciation, people usually connect that with. I don't want to be in the U.S. tax net, right? 
So U.S. is the only country uh, next to Eritrea that has this uh, tax system where you, if you are a citizen, you are a taxpayer. Uh, so that's not a case in any other country in the world. Um, and as soon as you kind of leave country, don't spend enough time there, you are not a tax resident. So you don't have to renounce that citizenship, actually. Um, so people usually connect kind of renunciation of citizenship with um kind of taxes which is not always the case and in most of the cases it's not the case so renunciation can come to for different reasons uh obviously some of the reasons are i have a couple of passports on the other side and i just don't need that because i have passports to substitute that one plus taxes i don't live there um so what's the reason why would i pay taxes to the U.S., have this additional compliance burden, um, you know, have have difficulties with my banks. I always have to fill a bunch of forms. Uh, I cannot go in certain country as American. Um, so why would I do that if I don't live there, if I have additional passports to substitute a U.S. passport? So it doesn't really make, makes much sense. Uh, and on the top of that, obviously, I have to look into taxes uh but also what we uh and i would say increasingly have in in the last couple of years is people who are renouncing u.s citizenship for kind of patriotic reasons like they don't feel connected with the u.s anymore they don't feel that what america stood for is still the case um I can't even go say, uh, how to say I heard from people because I feel like ashamed uh, of their nationality. So obviously those are like deeply personal and in a way kind of emotional reasons. Um, and uh, why would someone do that? But there there are cases like that. People just don't feel connected with a country anymore and they don't feel connected with the values of a country as of now. So I guess they are looking into renouncing citizenship, U.S. citizenship as a patri patriotic act. Like I'm doing that because I can no, no longer, I no longer stand for what, what, what is currently happening. Um, so there are people that obviously feel in that way and uh, more increasingly. Um, and as I said, they're, they're a part of this higher numbers of pronunciation is just people who, left us were living somewhere else uh who might have as i said another or multiple citizenship maybe they you know you also have a trend of people who whose ancestors came in the u.s now going back to you know where the ancestor came from and you know acquiring that those citizenship and just wanting to continue where you know, it kind of all started. So uh, this is also this is also something that might be the reason, like they cannot hold multiple citizenship and so on. So um, again, we're seeing different reasons. Uh, unfortunately, people always think about renouncing the citizenship from tax perspective. Obviously, that exists, uh, and it's not a small group of people, but it's not the only reason why people are doing it. Mm -hmm. What well, what about the pros though? So like when I think Andrew mentioned in the books because when he first wanted to renounce or mentioned it, he was he said he was coming from like a place of anger, and it it would have been an emotional decision. So when people come to him and want to renounce, he kind of tries to talk them out of it at first. It seems so. Like what does I I guess what do you say? Like are, have you thought of this? Like you'd be giving up this? Like uh yeah? Like what are the big pros of having the citizenship well i mean it's kind of whether there are big pros right if you're just looking from a simple simply objective standpoint mm -hmm. it's a citizenship as the as many others right it's not the best passport in the world it's not you know it comes with this tax burden it doesn't give you the most freedom so if if that is only thing in your mind, you can substitute that. Uh, it, it, renunciation is very emotional decision. Um, you know, though some people might start from the perspective of, yeah, I just don't want to pay taxes, right? Um, 
it, it deeply it is emotional decision again especially for 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 the us because it comes with so many um attached things um uh, and other countries do probably do not have such high number of people renouncing just because they can you know you you have other options uh but uh we're always really speaking very openly with clients and um though they might come and say yes this is something that i want to do i was thinking about it um we're definitely you know trying to first of all explain them wh what will happen after uh and is that something that they are ready um and also obviously go through go with them through the whole thought process why they are thinking that way and uh is there something else that they can do um and so on so this is not I guess that we're not doing that just because it is kind of good to have it right it's good to have your citizenship but just because we don't want our clients at least um to do it and then five years in a row say oh I, I made such a big mistake because I cannot visit uh you know I cannot go back and visit my family members or I cannot attend my daughter's wedding or uh, you know, my parents died and I cannot, you know, go to the grave. So th th that's kind of the biggest reasons why we're always trying to speak with people on a very human level uh, and understand what their needs are um, and what their thought process was behind it and why they're making decision. And on our side, we really need to make sure that they know the consequences of it. So are you aware that, you know, if something happens, you might not be able to go back to the U.S.? And for some people, that's okay, right? Yeah, I, I, my family is not there, right? Uh, or, you know, I don't have any other business. I'm not, li I'm not living in the U.S. for the last 20 years. Everything that I had uh, is somewhere else. So th that's a very easy case, right? Because it's just very easy going you know, you're renouncing citizenship, you're not using it, you don't have family, you don't have connections with the country, very easy. But especially for people who are doing it because of their uh, kind of patriotic need or because they don't feel connected with a country or things like that, we really need to sit down with them, talk them through, okay, this is, you know, explain that this is not an instant and easy decision. And even put put renunciation on the back burner. Okay, let you know, let's do some other things. Let's obtain other citizenship. Let's see how you feel about uh, how you feel moving to another country. Um, how you, you know, how you like somewhere. Uh, do you like spending time somewhere else more than in the U.S.? Um, and then, you know, after a couple of years, if everything you know sounds positive renunciation is kind of the easiest thing uh obviously once you sort out exit tax and things like that you know it's it's not so so difficult but um first is really making sure that you know you're making the right decision and that you want to look at it back five years later and say oh i made a mistake because it's un unreversible so you cannot go back to the us and say well i changed my mind can you please give me my citizenship back so there is no um there is no reason one thing that we hear uh from time to time is people who are thinking oh maybe i should do it because of taxes they come to us and say yes i want to renounce because of you know i i want to reduce my tax burden i want to become a tax resident of another country and so on and then when we start speaking they say yeah but i'm also looking for a passport that will allow me spending 8 to 9 months in the us it doesn't make sense, right? So you want to spend time there. You you actually have connection to have family. Why are you announcing? I mean, taxes, sure, but there there's a couple other things that can be done to reduce it. So it should not be the main motivator. So you you brought up the exit tax. Can you can you just sort of explain that and talk about how that's calculated? Because I had I was uh, I was not aware that that was a thing. So yeah, U.S. has um, has 
something is called kind of ex inter colloquially exit tax or covered expatriate uh, test. Basically, when you are looking to renounce your citizenship, um, they will look into your um, net worth. And if it is above 2 million, you are deemed to, plus some deductions, you are deemed to pay exit tax. So exit tax is basically a uh, capital gain tax um, that you are paying at the moment. So on, on value of all of your assets at the moment of renunciation as you as if you sold all of your assets at that moment. So basically you're paying that tax on unrealized gain as if you realize them. Um, so as I said, there are deductions on your primary home and kind of different, different other things. Uh, but basically if on everything on the top of 2 million, you should be paying that. Or if you, if you're in compliant, uh, if you were in compliant with your taxes in the last five years, you will be deemed covered expatriate slash subject to exit tax and things like that. So basically there is a, this kind of threshold that um, that you, you will need to comply with. Um, obviously there are different ways to reduce it and to structure it because um, again, people who are doing a renunciation for tax reasons they usually have more than two million um so um then there are a lot of different options to look to reduce it um obviously that's really case by case basis but the principle is uh is the same so basically when you are renouncing you will need to pay um capital gain tax on your unrealized capital as if you are selling it at the moment of renunciation is that is that common amongst other countries? Well, a couple other countries do have it. Um, for example, like Canada has it in some ways, uh, in some shape or form. When you are uh, when you are becoming a tax non-resident, so when you are leaving a country and saying, "Okay, guys, I I don't want to pay taxes to you anymore," um, uh, they do have it. Um, uh, I mean, a couple of European countries do have it, but that's not very. Um, it's not very frequent. It, it is really more of a kind of Western world <laughs> uh, type of thing. Okay. Uh, just, I, I, obviously this would be somewhat of a personal question, but just from a like services and like freedom standpoint, if you could pick like a smattering of citizenships to hold, like what would be your ideal like breakdown of like what passport or what citizenships you would want? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> I was not thinking of, of, of for myself, uh, but I would definitely look for one kind of very strong or re relatively strong that gives you access to, uh, you know, at least European Union visa free that you can probably easily get in Canada, Australia, just, just in case. Then I would look for one that has very kind of uh, unusual things like Russia, China, uh, <clears throat> and those kind of countries. Um, so that's probably always a good combination, right? Get one that gives you access to West, get one that gives you <clears throat> gives you access to um, to East. But actually not many people realize that, like most of Latin America passports are really good. Like uh, though they're, you know, not tier A passports, like you don't have, uh, I don't know, visa-free access to US or Canada or Australia, um, but you do have access to plenty of other countries. Um, so I'm I'm Serbian. Um, I have Serbian passport and like a main, main one. <clears throat> and so it, it's not the best one in the world, but it's very unusual one. Uh, because with my passport, I can really uh, relatively quickly um, get visas for like Australia, Canada, US. I have um, whole European Union. I have whole Latin America. Um, I have plenty of countries in uh, in Africa, uh, almost whole Asia. I have those very unique features like Russia, China, uh, Iran, <laughs> 
Um, we are also now getting like Saudi Arabia, which is very unusual. Not, not many countries have it. So um, people, when, when people are usually thinking about passwords, they are looking kind of those top, top tiers, like, oh, I want Japan. And it's very hard to get. Um, Singapore. So those are the, the best passports. But if you have kind of a mix of two, um, they can give you equally uh, equally uh, good <clears throat> access to to different countries. So uh, with obviously way lower price point, you don't have to maybe live there and so on. So uh, I think Latin American passports are really going to be uh, good in the future. Um, and they're, let's say, fairly easy to obtain. So a couple of years down the road and you, you can get those. Um, you know, if you live there, if you make a small investment there um, in like three to five to seven years, you can get it. Obviously, there is a bit of a bureaucracy behind that, uh, but it is not um, it is not anything uh, super scary. So I think those passports uh, will will increase their uh, kind of ratings um, in the next in the next couple of years. Definitely. Correct. We're seeing now, sorry, uh, we, we saw like this year a very interesting case. So um, I keep mentioning UAE, uh, like they were one of countries that 10 years ago had access to like 70 something country, which is nothing like very, you know, very basic passports, just basic, uh, you know, countries. And that, that was it. So during the course of 10 years, uh, they became one of the best passports in the world. So they made such big changes. Uh, they gain access to, uh, I don't know, a bunch of countries. So over the course of 10 years, that passport increased the value a lot. So probably the same thing, same thing is happening with, you know, some smaller countries that people are not really thinking about. As I said, I mentioned Serbia, but, um, you know, we significantly increased the passport power in the last couple of years and from what i see the government is really working on it you know as we speak as i said saudi arabia then we're getting mexico and some other things um that we previously didn't have so it might not be kind of amazing the most amazing thing at the moment but over the course of a couple of years uh, it definitely uh, will increase uh, increase its power same thing as with latin american countries Okay. Got any more questions, Al? I think sure. we're probably coming up on an hour. Yeah, yeah. Well, Yovana, thanks so much for coming on. It's uh, definitely something uh, that we don't really think about a lot, kind of just take it for granted and don't really question our citizenship. So it's def definitely the Nomad Capitalist was definitely an interesting book and definitely interesting talking to you. Thank you, guys. It was really great speaking with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Please reach out to us at brothersonbooks at gmail.com for any book recommendations or if you would like to be a guest host for a particular book you have in mind. A great review or rating on whichever platform you're listening to would be greatly appreciated. And lastly, if you can think of any friend, family member, or coworker that might like this episode, please pass it along. Jack, I think it was a good episode. Uh, another special thanks to Yovana for coming on. Uh, it was a good book, Nomad Capitalist. And uh, what, what book are we doing next? We are reading Underground, The Tokyo Gas Attack and the Japanese Psyche by Haruki Murakami. All right. Well, I guess till next time. Till next time.